So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming in. We know that we're going to be a small but committed group, and that's okay to start with. That's fine. Um, so let's introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Kyrie Kellon. I'm the Director of Development and Community Engagement here at BFIS. This is my third month, so I joined in August. Um, and my background has been in lots of different things, in communications, in marketing, in student recruitment, in college counselling, and I've worked in five different international schools across the globe. Um, so this is uh, a really big kind of new role for me in terms of community engagement, developing the project that's happening across the road with the new building and getting uh, both staff and students as well as parents involved in the things that really build community here at BFIS. So I'm excited to start working with you on hearing some of your ideas about what those things should look like. I'll pass you over to Scott. No, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you want to do that first? All right. No, let's, let's do it. Okay. I'll come right, back to those photos. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Emsey, and I am the Global Citizenship and Action Leader here at BFIS. Uh, it is my first year here, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm coming to you from West Africa, where I spent uh, seven years in the Gambia as a both a middle and high school humanities teacher, as well as a service learning coordinator. Uh, and that is where I got my start in service learning, which I'll talk about in just a second. But like Kyra said, very happy to be here. Uh, and excited to see uh, where we can take this project this year and beyond. Before I explain the pictures, I'd like to know what, what grades your children are in, just so that I have that in my head. So I know Should we do just introductions yeah, to let's, a small group? Yeah, let's do that. You don't have to use the mic. <laughs> I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, Taylor Pince, great to meet you all. Um, I, am, I have a daughter in grade four. Um, and uh, I'm originally from uh, Turkey, but lived in Canada for many years and moved here two and a half years ago. Thanks. Uh, my name is Sonia. I'm, I'm the mom of a grader. Um, I'm in Catalans. Uh, I never live uh, outside. Um, happy to meet you all. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. I'm Rishina. I moved here from the US. Uh, this is our second year. I have, I have seventh graders, two kids in the seventh year, they're twins. Rashida. 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 Great to meet you. Hi, my name is Nilagra. Um, I'm a mom to a fifth grader. I'm from Peru. My husband is Spanish. We've been living here for a while. So, yeah. Nice. Happy to be here. Sorry? Happy to have you here. Thank you. Sit here. And I can just see Jennifer's walked in. Can you, would you be time. happy to do, just tell us which grade your kids are in? Sure. Hi, I'm Jennifer Webster, and I have a 10th and 11th grader. And we moved here, last year was our first year. Um, we American, Hungarian, and Argentine. Hungarian, Argentine, and American. Okay, cool. cool. <laughs> Great. Well, it's awesome. It's awesome to know that most of your kids are, are, are lower down in the school. That gives us time to plan and to make sure that by the time they come up into middle and high school, um, they're going to be super engaged. So we have what we know is a big task in front of us, um, getting students, getting uh, teachers, getting parents to find the projects that, that make sense for everybody, that make sense for learning, that make sense for what we do want to do in our local community. Um, that's why I'm really happy that we have folks in the room who had a few years here already. I've lived on and off in Barcelona for 10 years, so I'm really excited about making links with our community. It's going to be absolutely fantastic to have a new space where we can host things and we can invite people in from all different walks of life, and that's part of the goal that I have. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about why that is my goal, because I think it's really important to center for you to understand a little bit about our backgrounds and where we come from, and why why we think this is so important for BFIS, right? Why why we our roles really shouldn't work together, but we do because we care about the same things. Um, so I want to take you to um, a school that I worked at in Costa Rica, which was between 2016 and 2018, and this school was called 
the United World College. Now, if any of you have heard of the United World Colleges, you know what they do. They're a group of schools that were founded after the Second World War. They started in Wales, in the UK. Um, and they have 18 different schools across the world that intentionally mix students from different socioeconomic backgrounds in different countries to live together. So some are full schools that run all the way through from kindergarten, but the majority are just two years of the IB diploma. So students come from maybe 70, 80, 90, 100 different countries. They mix, they have conflicts, they have to resolve those conflicts, they have to get on, they live together, and they finish the IB. And these students um, are mission-driven, so they're selected based on the mission of those schools, which is to uh, foster peace, sustainability, and to work with conflict resolution. So you can imagine it's quite a transformative place, both for the students, but also for the staff. Um, and on this uh, particular trip that I'm going to talk to you about, this was a trip that the whole school would do every year. So the entire school had a service learning component throughout, but the, whole, the entire school would stop for a week. Everybody on campus, virtually barring the, the finance staff and the ki kitchen staff who would stay, everybody had a group assigned to them and would go out to do a service project with their students. So you'd have between 16 and 18 students and you'd be assigned a place in the country and you would go and do something working with those students, working with the local communities and really understanding a bit more about the context that we were in. And so I want to kind of tell you about uh, this boy who's here on the left. Um, his name was Angat. His name is Angat. And he's a Nepali student who came to us from the SOS villages. So these schools also took in refugee students and children who had been in foster care or had been uh, in care. And he was one of those students. He'd lived in Kathmandu um, and he'd come through the SOS vi children's villages system. So he arrived at the school. He was on a full scholarship. He needed scholarship money to go and do anything like his weekends. He needed a full scholarship to go off to university. And the schools, and the, the role that I had at that time, was to work with the universities to get those students into full scholarship places at different universities worldwide. Um, but this was Angat's first trip. It was his first year in the school, um, and it was his first time going on a bus to a trip with a load of other students somewhere new. And when we got there, he climbed this little... Uh, I could see his face kind of getting, his, his eyes getting wider on the way on the bus, right? I could see he was sort of taking it all in. He was really like having a moment. We got there and he, he ran away from the group to go and climb this little, this little tree, this little uh, branch, and just sit and look at the ocean. And he said it was the first time he'd ever seen the sea. It was the first time he'd ever seen the ocean. And he sat there on his own for about a good five to eight minutes before I went over and I talked to him about what he was doing. And that picture encapsulates my wife. It's the reason I come to work. It's the reason I do everything I do. And it's the same reason with your children. I love that moment when you see a child's eyes just widen because they've discovered something and they've had a moment of, of learning. They've had a moment of, of, of reflection that really stuck with them, that makes them a, a human, that, that has a different trajectory after that moment. We do that in schools all the time. And what we want to do is do that more with those elements of being able to, to get out of your comfort zone, to go and help others, to make sure that you feel like you're part of a community that has a reason for being has a reason, a purpose, a, a, a mission. And you can see Angat here smiling away. He was, he was the happiest student, and he was the happiest kid on this trip, I think. The other students were from Norway, from Sweden, from uh, Italy, from England, from Nigeria, from Costa Rica, uh, Dutch. Yeah, they, they were a complete mixed group. Um, but that is where I'm happiest. As an educator, you know, in a group of uh, kids whose backgrounds maybe are very, very different, who maybe don't have the same common language at the beginning, but by the end of whatever it is that you've done with them, they have a shared understanding, they have a shared language, they have an experience that has been formative. And I think part of the role and part of the reason that we want to get parents involved is because we know that you help us model those values with, the, with your children. If we're singing from the same hymn sheet here at school as well as at home, that's our goal. That parents obviously have this, this need and this desire to see their children going off into the world to do good things. We have the same goal. And together we feel like we need to be working on the same thing. So that's a, I think that's important for you to understand kind of some of the projects that we've worked on. Um, this, was a, this was a kind of beach uh, cleanup project that we did, but we also planted a lot of trees and we also did um, a lot of work with local community schools where we, where we did English language teaching. Um, but it was more about, you know, 
making sure that we didn't just drop in and leave. Every year those, those links were formed with different students. So even though the students who were going through changed, um, the actual links were formed um, for, for quite a long time. So they were always expecting us. And, they, and we also knew that it was a trip to learn a lot from the local community. I'll hand over to you, Scott, because I know you've got a similar experience. Yeah. That was, that was fantastic. So what I think uh, stands out to me the most about what Kyra said is that you know something completely new is transformational. What I what I and I'm just thinking about this now, but what what I would like to propose from this is that these students have been living in the Gambia for years. Yeah, that's all they knew actually. All these students that are up there, they only knew the Gambia. But because of the project, because of service learning, it was something completely new still. Even though it was their environment, their surroundings, their culture, it was completely new. So I think service learning offers both completely new transformational practices uh, for people that are new to the area, for new to Barcelona, like myself. I myself am finding my uh, self-reflecting, like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And at the same time, people that have lived in Barcelona their entire lives, service learning offers something new for them as well. Um, so the service project that I'd like to talk about, and also maybe I should start by just saying that it's important, I would point it out as well, that we have a, we have kind of like a younger uh, families here right now, which is great, because the IB is in this kind of period of transition that by 2025, 2026, their curriculum or their framework, that's not really a curriculum, but their framework is shifted, and the emphasis is going to be even greater on service they're calling it now engagement. So maybe we should start shifting away from the service language and start saying engagement. So the engagement project uh, that I want to talk about is just kind of a, this is where I'm coming from, is uh, from 2017. When I moved to the Gambia in 2016, the director there, um, we're MSA accredited, the director said, you're the guy for service learning, we're gonna ship you off to uh, Kenya, and you're gonna stay there for a week, and you're gonna train, I trained with this uh, woman named Tara Barton, who is phenomenal. She works in Johannesburg uh, in service learning engagement and trained with her for a week and came back and my eyes were just popping. I was ready to go. I had been in the Gambia for a year already at this point, but I was still just, I was ready to go. So we have a friend uh, there named Jogu Toure, really amazing artist, phenomenal person, wise, wise man beyond his years, although he's an elderly guy, but he's very, very honest. And we talk all the time, we sit down and have tea and talk, and what, what can we do? What can we do? And he came up with the idea, it was all his idea, biomass briquettes. He had worked in a village uh, called Makumbaya, which is just near the airport in Banjul, and he had noticed that the forests that were all indigenous tree species, used for medicinal purposes, natural homeopathic medicines, etc., were being deforested. They were protected by the government, but they were still being deforested. So this is an issue, right? How can we change this? He came up with the idea, biomass briquettes, peanut shells, sawdust. I'm sorry, biomass briquettes. Instead of coal, they were, thank you, that's a great question. So the, the trees were being cut down for fuel to cook. So to replace the coal, we have biomass briquettes made of peanut shells, sawdust, Paper, um, sawdust, paper, peanut shells, paper, which is easy to find. Carpentry is a big profession in the Gambia. There's sawdust everywhere, otherwise it just goes back to dust. We use that. Peanut shells, uh, half of the Gambia's economy is agricultural. Peanuts are still a staple crop in the Gambia. Peanut shells are everywhere. Great, we can use those. And paper, you see anyone walking on the street in the morning or at dusk, in the afternoon, they're carrying a loaf of bread or a baguette wrapped in paper that came from Belgium, came from Spain. Who knows? That paper, after it's used, where's it going to go? We turn it into biomass briquettes. So we came up with this recipe for making these briquettes, this process for making these briquettes, making it easy so that it can transmit to uh, the village of Makumbaya and other villages around this area. And we come up with this plan. How are we going to turn this into a project? Students need to understand the issues, they need to do research, they need to ask questions, commit surveys, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the whole concept here of engagement is, these are, these are classroom skills, this is content knowledge, but it's being transmitted into the community. So here we have Raya and Aziz, they're presenting at a 
of what we call the celebration of learning about the biomass briquettes. Why are they a solution? They have to understand that problem, solution. Then we have Julia, who's actually from Barcelona, uh, here holding the briquette. And if you knew Julia, and you knew that smile, this is very much in line with what Kyra was talking about with that kind of like just that moment. Right? This, is, this is something. Uh, part of the project was to partner with a school in the Kumbaya. We partnered with them to uh, give them art lessons, to learn and understand how they perceive the issue of deforestation in their community, um, and create a plan to work together to solve it or approach the problem. So it was art lessons, it was content, it was discussions, and it all kind of culminated in this giant mural that's still in the Kumbaya. We were just there in September and we got to see it. Um, but the idea is to tell the story. We have the beautiful forest at the beginning, and it's all obviously drawn by students and painted by students. The beautiful forest, we come along, looks like this, and then we have a better solution, biomass briquettes. And then we go back to where we all start. So that face is pretty powerful. In the classroom, she was researching, investigating, learning you know, valuable skills, and then she worked on it in the community. That's exactly what we want to do here at the FIS with this project. So, um, I don't know if, um, well, yeah, let's, let's talk about what we've, what we've named it. So you may have seen, during the parent-teacher conferences, you might have seen some of these green posters around. They didn't do the job very well. A lot of people missed them. Um, but what we were trying to do was we were trying to survey the parent community on what was important to you. Um, we have come up with a, a kind of theme, and the idea is that annually, the Take Action for Impact Projects Tally, so that's what your little badge, now you know what it means, if somebody asks you what that stands for. Um, the idea is that the, the annual theme will change, but the areas or the buckets of interest that we have in the community will remain similar, right? So we don't want to have flash in the pan service projects or, or engagement projects. We want to make sure that we build programs of longevity with community partners that are meaningful to us as a community. Now, we know that our community shifts and it will adapt, but we want to make sure that if we have families here with local connections to charities, um, you know, nursing homes, residential homes, whatever it might be, that we continue to build those links over time. However, how we build those links and the projects that the students get involved with may change according to the, uh, the annual theme. So this year's theme is building a sustainable future. Now we think that encompasses lots of different possibilities, but when we put that up and we said, get involved with building a sustainable future, we realized nobody knew what we meant. So we had to be more specific, and that's why we made a survey saying, there are some areas of interest that we've identified as being important to the students already. What we'd like to know is where you also have a dual or a joint interest in those areas and where you maybe even have a career network or a background or friends or family members working in that area so that we can bring in mentors, we can bring in speakers and we create links outside of the school that go further than just our networks, which is obviously difficult when you have staff who are new in a city. Um, so these are some of the buckets, these are some of the areas that we've identified. And because you're here, I know that some of you already know very well what these are. Um, but we have identified them through community members who've already raised their hands. I know we have Taylor in the room, and you, you uh, put your, your hand up, and I'm thank you, thankful for that, that you're interested in robotics and technology. We have another parent, Martin Picard, who's absolutely fantastic, and some of you may have been to his farm up in Alea. Uh, he's running a kind of green hub that has PhD students that's working with robotics, uh, working on watering and farming plants, lots of different projects there, uh, uh, lots of different sustainability related things. Um, very interested in soil quality, food, um, organic food and growth. Um, we also have a social justice and poverty alleviation area because that is a specific interest to some of our staff here and we know that it's, um, it, it's important to some of our parents as well, of course it is. Creativity in the arts is one of the vision, of learning, vision for learning pillars, so it's something that will go directly into the fabric of the school as is already being kind of embedded in the school, but it's something that will continue to grow as well as robotics. Um, impact investment and social entrepreneurship is already running here. Um, there's a social entrepreneurs uh, group that Scott can tell you a bit more about. Active lifestyles is another big area of the vision for learning and it's something that will continue to gain uh, traction and speed. And so you'll see that we have some events already aligned with that. 
And then language acquisition by bilingualism and multilingualism is an incredibly important part of the pillar of being an international school. But it's also something that will allow us to make more inroads because what we've seen is that many people with a will to do some kind of volunteer work feel that there is an, a barrier if they don't feel confident in the language. And so they're automatically self-limiting to projects or programs that they can do in English. So that's something that we want to make sure that we are addressing and giving people the tools and the skills and the confidence to go a little bit outside of their comfort zones. Is there anything you want to add to that? So we go. Okay, so yeah. So the idea, okay, let's go back to that. The idea is that at the end of the year, at the end of this school year, the vision for what TAFI will become, the Take Action for Impact, um, projects will be kind of uh, a, a little bit like you saw in Scott's example of that that, um, that pr project that, that you showed us in the picture. There will be a, an exhibition of learning. Uh, and the goal is that the students, both CAST students but students who are also pre-CAST, will be getting the, ab the ability, will be building their ability to talk about what they have learned and to show it off in an exhibition format. And that will be a celebratory event that will invite community partners, that will invite um, different role models in. It will be held off campus for two reasons. One is that we are incredibly limited for space to host big events and exhibitions while the building work is going on. But the second is probably a little bit more important, and for me it would be off campus always. Um, until you have a space that really feels like it has an external audience. It's very important for the students that they feel that it's real. It's very important that they feel that they have external people who matter and that their work will be seen and that it matters. And that it will have a, a, a kind of pe a, a, um, a pedestal given to it. So we want to be able to celebrate those accomplishments. We want to give the students freedom to express however they want, whatever the work is that they've done. So that could be a documentary film, that could be a, a, a PowerPoint, it could be a TED talk, it could be a performance, it could be a piece of music, whatever they feel expresses what they have learned. So that it's a kind of multimedia exhibition, so it's actually interesting for us to attend, right? Um, and so we've, we've, we've already pitched this to the students, and we need your help in kind of being able to buttress what we're saying in school by telling them that their parents are also interested and involved, and that you may also be willing to give us contacts, or willing to give us mentors, or willing to think about how you can be involved in a way that pushes projects forward. I'm going yep. to ask you to kind of comment a little bit on the pillars now, the vision for learning pillars. Uh, I just want to go back to what this means for your student at school, too, yeah. if I can. Yeah. Um, the advisory program here at BFIS, uh, every other day, there is a 45-minute block of time that's chunked out for advisories. All your students are in advisories. That is a crucial time for us to reach them for digital citizenship. Uh, other other aspects of their, you know, their student lives, including this, including engagement. So that's 45 minutes every other day that we can create and craft a program that they are specifically um, focusing on learning about en environmental issues this year, sustainability this year. Next year, we don't know. So that's 45 minutes every other day. The other thing that I want to point out too is that this is something that we want to bring teachers into as well because there's amazing things that are happening here with our units, with our curriculum, with our teachers and their interests and their passions. We want to loop that in as well. So your students are getting it in advisories, they're getting it from their regular you know, their regular you know, teacher lessons, that sort of thing. They're getting it kind of everywhere. And to kind of round that out, like I was saying, it's really important that you guys are there and knowledgeable about this as well. Yeah, I heard from your science teacher that you're doing this cool citizen science project with the uh, Colcerola. Tell me more about that. That's a conversation you'd be, you'd be like, really happy to have with your students, right? So this is this is kind of like the rounding goal. It's it's not only you guys, it's not only community organizations, it's also the school itself, of course. And that maybe leads us well into the pillars, like you said. Um, so the strategic the school strategic plan, which was developed uh, a couple of years ago, includes these three learning pillars. And I think that engagement really covers all of these very, very well. Experiential learning, that is exactly what we're talking about here. Sharing that, demonstrating our knowledge at the end of these experiential learning experiences or events or activities, that's crucial. The students, as a teacher, you don't know if a student has it until they present it, they share it, or they talk about it. This is that opportunity. This Take Action for Impact or Taffy Symposium. So experiential learning, got that covered. Creativity and innovation. This, 
just a huge part of the school going forward. The new building is, as Carl was alluding to, this is a huge part of our, our goal for developing this, this program, this, this, this ongoing project. So creativity and innovation. Are we going to have students write songs? We have some, some amazing songwriters. A student came up to me yesterday and said, hey, I have an idea for a cast project. Is it okay if I, I, be, I have a music producer program after school offered to middle school students? I was like, yes, of course. That's amazing. Uh, creativity and innovation. Is it going to be a drama? In, in the Gambia, I had students every single year. We had a talent show every single year. And for some reason, there was a group of students every single year. They were committed to having a dramatization about the service learning goal for that year. I don't know what it was, but it was that group of students every single year. You can ask my wife Lee about it. Creativity and innovation, we support that wholeheartedly through their learning and experiencing uh, issues related to this year's theme of sustainability. And individual potential. What do you want to do? You want to learn about this? Let's do it. We're unlocking all of that potential by saying, Anything related to sustainability, let's do it. You're, you're in an advisory. Your advisor's really into that. Let's go that route. You have a small group of friends that's really passionate about healthy lifestyles. Uh, we have a group of mountain bikers. Man, do these guys love mountain biking. They love mountain biking. Why not turn that into a project and say, let's, let's share some knowledge about the Pulse Remola. We live uh, in Valdebrera. There are flags everywhere in Belvedere. Coles Roll and Peril. Coles Roll and Peril. Let's link up with those people. Let's link up with the park uh, people. Let's find. Some, let's make some advocacy campaign. If you care about mountain biking, well, you should care about where you're mountain biking too. So individual potential. Guys, limit. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think the next part is about how you can get involved. So I'm glad we have Jill here, because she represents kind of the grade 12 and the upper school. We have upper school over here, and everybody else is lower school. Um, so what we're asking from you today, really, is we're asking you for both ideas, um, and we're asking you to think a little bit about your ecosystems, your own personal ecosystems. So whether that is that you can offer up support for a project that's already running, and you already know that we have a link that is important to you, um, whether that be, is that you could become a point person for an area that we've, we've highlighted that is of interest to the students and you have a career background in that area or you have a good network in that area. Um, you could act as a TAFI leader, so that would mean that we could point both teachers and students to you in order to get feedback on their project ideas, to ask questions, to maybe be connected to other adults for whom that is also a meaningful area, right? And as we know, those mentors, the, the students have to see it to be it. They have yeah. to be able to understand what it looks like to be successful in something that is related to sustainability. They need, they need role models. They need somebody to, to model that for them. Or they need somebody who's super passionate and can help um, coach them towards the answer for their own project. Because sometimes they come in already with amazing ideas that are almost there and they just need a little bit of support from us as adults. Um, so what we're asking for are more subject specialists and more areas where you can give us support because we certainly can't lead everything in robotics. We certainly can't lead everything in sustainable food and farming. So as a supporter, um, you can lend us your knowledge, your expertise, as somebody interested. You can lend us connections um, or be kind of fostering those links, being able to put us in contact with organizations. So this is especially important if you've got a really long history in Barcelona and you know local organizations or pathways or other research areas or anything that might be useful for us to bring, bring in front of the students because as you've heard there's time that we can find in the programming what we need to be able to do is link that up to who we have in the room and widen that circle so that the list of people that they can go to for concepts ideas and feedback is bigger um, projects so if you know of a project that's been running that was uh, that maybe you know died a death some years ago or maybe it was dormant uh, or maybe there's something that you've heard about recently in Barcelona that you think is important that we know about bring it to us. We're asking you to kind of help alert us to specific projects currently running, and um, we can put those in front of students as needed. And then other resources are always important to us as well. So to make this work, to make this work at a time when the campus is compromised because we have space issues while we're waiting for the big, amazing center that's going to be kind of a hub for lots more of this work, in the meantime, we need spaces. We need event spaces. We possibly need um, ideas for where students can go out and do projects so that we don't you know, have to battle for space here. 
Um, resor other resources are also welcome. You know, that could be that I want to give snacks, or I want to be able to, um, you know, have those uh, help us with getting students to and from. Hosting events is, is a big one for us. That's really what we're looking for. Um, but we're open to ideas, right? So if something comes to mind and you think, right, I know this lab, I know the kids should be there, I want to work with the school on how to get a, a group there to go and witness something that I know is being worked on that will inspire. We kind of want to be the gateway, but we don't want to be gatekeepers. We want to extend the, the, the welcome out to you and, and make sure that you know we're open to hear your ideas. And thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who's already put their hand up to be kind of a point of contact or a point of interest for us. This was what we gathered so far from the survey. Um, if you haven't filled it in, we'd love to hear from you, and we'll obviously ask you some questions at the end now. But we've already got people who've raised their hands and said, I'm interested in this area, it's also important to me, and I may have connections for you. And so that is what we're looking for. Anything that comes to mind, any ideas that start to form in this meeting, we'd love you to kind of, you know, let them bubble away, sit on them, or by the end of the meeting, leave us with some ideas of your own. Um, because it's really important to us that we, we get this going and we kind of put the fire into the second term. We're already a term in. Uh, we needed to find our feet and we needed to make sure that we understood how things, how things worked a little bit here, but we're trying to build something that will have longevity and that will be of interest to students as they move up to the school. And will be something that the cool older kids get to do, right? It's something to aspire to, to be able to lead a project and work on something that's meaningful to you. We want to encourage the coolness of that. Um, as well as obviously the benefits that it brings to students in terms of project-based learning, in terms of confidence and in terms of connections. Um, and those four C's, you know, the creativity, confidence, collaboration, communication that they will get. Was there anything else to say about contacts or leads? Are there any questions to this point about the two, we've kind of put them into leaders category and then supporters category. We would like every single BFIS, you know, community member to be a supporter. Just thinking about a connection, a project, and ex expertise that you have or somebody you know has. And that's kind of where we'll end today, is yeah. kind of gathering this. Yeah. But that's the supporters, and that really should be everybody. Uh, but then there's also this leaders group, this leaders category, and they, like uh, Kyra was saying, are the point people for these projects, for these activities, these learning activities, both in school and outside of school. Thanks, Scott. So I, I don't think that was totally clear. The leaders are the people who we can also help staff be connected to. So if a teacher has an idea, they want to run the project. Let's go back a little bit. Yeah, if a teacher has an idea, the leaders are kind of helping us be a liaison both with staff and with students, with organizations as well. So maybe you already have a charity link or you already have a contact in an organization that is important to you. Um, that would be you taking a step forward and doing a bit more than being a supporter because that would help us, for example, invite that organization into the symposium and you would be our connect for that. So you would say, I have this contact over here in Acción Contra el Hambre. I want them to come to the symposium. I want them to see the results of the students' work that they've done. Um, I'm happy to invite them in and I'm happy to be the, the, the point person for the school on that connection. And we will build that out over time so that we have a database, so that we have a network that we all know about that doesn't just disappear when a staff member leaves or a family leaves, but that those links start to become uh, ground in to the fabric, woven into the fabric of the school. Um, so this is the wider team, and so we are more than just us. Uh, Laura Blair, who's um, the IB coordinator, is instrumental here. Um, this is a passion area for Rachel, and she's really supportive, and she comes to our meetings. But the team on the ground will be um, Michelle Schuler, Rhonda Leshman, who's what is what is Michelle's uh, official title? She's NYP a, coordinator. NYP coordinator. Sorry. So you have IBDP coordinator and NYP coordinators. You have the school counselor for high school, Rhonda Leshman, and Bears Allen, who you all know from after school activities. Um, and so it's important to all of us because it's meaningful, but it's also those are the links that we understand are pivotal within the school to sell this to students because they also need to be reminded about the why. Sometimes they come in with their own motivation. Sometimes they've had that modeled at home. Sometimes it's wonderful that they come in they're already brimming with ideas. But some of them need to be reminded, hey, this is a part of your curriculum. It's important in the context of your studies. It's important to get academic um, you know, grades. But it's also really important to external bodies like colleges. It's also really important that you're active and that you're um, having a 360 education and that you're doing things that are more than just about your own achievement. And by the way, this is part of your achievement. It's going to make you into a more well-rounded human. We all know that sometimes the students uh, need to hear that again and again. And they, and they need to be reminded about the why. Um, so we're, we're hoping that what 
will happen over time is that that will change. It won't be that we need to tell them. It will be that they've had it modelled so many times from older students and from parents and from community leaders that it just becomes something which is understood, right? That's the point. Yeah, so we asked you if you have questions. Do you have any questions at this time before we break out into asking you some questions? Go for it. Do a sample. <laughs> uh, so, like Kara said, one of the things that we're, we're I think it's okay. Thanks. one of the things that we're trying to discover and understand more about this uh, this community as we build this project, this ongoing project, this event, is the sharing of communication, sharing of information. And uh, so we're just kind of curious. We have a weekly, we have um, WhatsApp groups, we have the Friday. Mingle coffee Fridays, Friday coffee in the mornings at the gate, where I've met some of you. We have we have all these different things that are happening for information. So perhaps maybe the better question here is, what is the best method of communication for reaching parents? What would you what would you say is maybe the best way of reaching families? Is it the WhatsApp chats? Or? I think it depends on if you're just if the broad strokes general kind of informative comment then it's probably in the weekly mm -hmm. but if you get if you're involved in something already and there's you know like a subgroup then mm -hmm. i think the whatsapp chats um if you're, if you're getting more detailed information stakeholders are really interested in something well. yes, so helpful. for this group what would be i guess that that would help us what would be the preferred method of communication with this group about this subject as a tappy leader email or supporter. okay email that's a vote for email. Any other any other takers? Do you prefer to have a WhatsApp group about it? <laughs> no. I think it depends on yeah. if you're involved in a project. Yeah. Let's imagine taking sandwiches down to mm -hmm. what is this group called? Yeah. 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 You know, and you're involved in that, then yeah, then I think a WhatsApp chat is probably for the that. most effective yeah. because it's it's detailed information about yeah, it's next Tuesday, see you at the you know, this yeah. address at a time. For logistics. But, I think it, but for it, general information, bigger picture, yeah. is email. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I, the, the biggest, biggest picture, I guess, is the, is the portal to just find out, to gauge interest in any any yeah. major events that are happening that you want to inform the whole community. And of course, like the, 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 the week. The And then for those who are saying, hey, yeah. we're trying to create the game. Right. I yeah. think one thing is like with email, it will be more one way. Yeah. You know, like it will be from you to us. Yeah. But if you want any kind of ideation mm -hmm. or discussion going on, then yeah. it's going to be WhatsApp or similar. Like there needs to be a chat going on for people to, to share, uh, share ideas and links and all of that. Like I don't think anyone's going to send emails to a group. Yeah. Like right. That's very yeah. unlikely. Yeah. Okay. So it depends on the purpose of this. Thank you. Yeah, we're still learning, and it's uh, there's a lot of different communication channels, and you know everyone has their own preferred methods, and so we want to know what works for you, because we don't want you to come to one meeting and then feel like the information was too intangible, or it, or it got too big, or it wasn't it wasn't relevant to you. So we're asking you that question so we know how best to communicate with you. And one one thing that we've discussed frequently is that every time we have an individual conversation with a parent or a family member of a student here, there are tons of ideas. Yeah. There are exactly what we're trying to get information about today. There are lots of things that come up. And we know that parents are interested in becoming engaged. We know that there's a lot of resources and knowledge and experience and all that uh, with our community. And it's just a matter of finding the, the best way to tap into that and the best way to draw that out at, at times that are not exactly convenient. The Tuesday morning, you're all here. We greatly appreciate your time. Uh, but you know, Friday mornings at drop off, yeah. that's another time to just check in. Yeah. What are the what are the times that we can meet? And maybe that is just virtually with WhatsApp. I don't know. Yeah. I think with email too the important thing because there are always the bloody GDPR or whatever issues. But if we could um, anyone who is getting involved in something to remove that because if you have to communicate with us through uh, BCC mm -hmm. then, then it isn't going to be a community because then mm -hmm. you're just speaking at us. Um, uh, versus, um, for sure, the WhatsApp for details. But if we're like working and building a project and you want to share links and and elaborate on things, then I think email is still relevant yeah. uh, as a way for us to communicate back with those other parents, stakeholders, yeah. groups. But you have to let us see each other's email addresses because otherwise it won't work. It's hard. Yeah, that's true. I think I think this diagram is it's a place, place to that point <laughs> that there is. At least for our goal, yeah, we, we need a, to be internally able to correct, correct, and and the importance that not only 
Taffy leaders or every Taffy supporter for that matter, but playing and talking to their other contacts, their friends, their, their students, your kids' friends, parents, mm -hmm. the people that you see you know on weekends that you go to their house and stuff. That's hey, we went to that talk Tuesday with Kyra Scott. You know, we talked about this really interesting event that's going to happen in June, and have you heard about it? Can I tell you about it? You know, not to be weird or whatever. <laughs> but, like, but I think it actually it's a great slide that you add if you're concerned about the communication channels. I think mm -hmm. each one and Shara and I had lots of conversations about the different channels and the different ways to reach the different stakeholders in this community. So I think it is like maybe for the parents that can have it in there. It is probably the What's up? in scale it's the, the newsletter, but then it's the WhatsApp uh, chat that by by grade. But for the students now there's finally kind of working. Student connections. Yeah, the student that yeah, among the, the not morning announcements. What was this we call it? Or was it it's called student connections? Uh, yeah, student connections. Yeah. yeah. Because that's been that's been sorely missing. There was no consistent channel for contacting the students. And right. Like, you know, because like one in teacher or whatever. So right. if that channel is actually properly working and internally in the school, I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, more poster making, maybe getting students involved, but more yeah. um, visible, physical, visible presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my goal next year is to have students at this meeting, yeah. explaining to you what they're doing, yeah. explaining to you why they're doing it, but, but and it will change this. Up in yeah. school. Like, there's got to be a lot more that can make it to raise it. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a class of its own, right? That's the thing. It's not skipping a class when it's part of your curriculum. Project project based work is part of the yeah. curriculum, so. and it's incredibly important. So we want we want them to be part of the discussion. We don't want it to be adult run. They're they're kind of now off to the side, and they should be in the middle. So we want to make sure that they are. Um, so one of the things we wanted to ask you, if we skip forward, I think we have some, some, uh, some events. We wanted to show you some of the things that we know are calendared already that we want to kind of have be part of the Taffy umbrella. Um, so Scott, do you want to talk through the Race Against Hunger and how that happened? Yeah. Um, so the Race Against Hunger is a organization that's you know international, well-known organization. They have a chapter here in Barcelona, of course. And uh, every year they have their own theme. And this year it's um, Cameroon, or yeah, Cameroon, hunger in Cameroon. And because of the climate crisis, there's obviously an issue with agricultural uh, output in Cameroon. And so their goal is each year they create a series of lessons that are aimed towards different age groups. And our goal here is that those our students, we've already got a group of four, four uh, 11th graders, we're going to deliver those lessons to uh, elementary and middle school students about issues in Cameroon related to agriculture, related to the climate crisis. And then they will also be organizing this actual race against hunger, which is a five kilometer race. We are, we've put in our uh, official uh, pledge to the, the uh, government that we are going to take the Colcerola, hopefully if we get our permit for uh, our 5K up on the Colcerola, the four students, their cast students, 11th graders, they will organize that. All the bibs, all the fundraising will be organized and led by these students. And the, the point is to raise awareness about hunger issues, not only in Cameroon, but also the climate crisis here in Barcelona, how it affects here in Barcelona. The cool thing in addition to that is that this event on May, uh, April 20th, I've changed dates, so I gotta get that method again, April 20th, uh, is that there will be the race itself organized by the students, well, before that, there will be the lessons, then the race, and then following the race the same day, which is a Saturday, this is a Saturday, uh, there will be a party here on campus to kind of celebrate to be, um, what in the past was known as the fun run, so this will be kind of like a fun day, so a potluck, music, games, activities, just a kind of celebration will be coming out of winter, uh, April 20th, hopefully, oh, yeah. and that will be kind of a time to, to kind of celebrate that. So the, the Race Against Hunger is a big, big uh, goal for our, our students this year. They're going to deliver those lessons, which is great. We're going to organize that event, hopefully on the first roll if we get the government's permit on uh, April 20th. And then we'll have the PTA uh, Booster Club organizing a, a, a party down here on the campus. I, I understand it's an international organization and their theme is Cameroon, but can I just 
say, I think, I mean, to connect with the community, it would be really great if it was somehow more locally focused. It has a relevant work or, or do the Gambia, of which the school is about to have a connection with or something. Is there some not way to make it more? That's why we're running in the Coastal Rolla, to okay. raise attention to issues in the Coastal okay. Rolla. So it's because environmental it's all issues. all about Cameroon, but then we're running no. here, and then we're going to the Gambia. Fundraising, it's like a little... The fundraising goes to Cameroon, okay. uh, which I think everyone can support, uh, but the issue, the local issue here will be the goal school, and that's why we're running it. So it has international and local. And how, how they said besides running, but what, what is it doing the local issue? Like how, how I think it's going to raise awareness. I think the goal is to raise awareness about what's happening in the goal school. It's, it's up to the students. So the, the organization decides the theme each year, and this is this is a, a, a good, an easy one to start with for us because it's something that already has you know, lessons planned, marketing materials, mm -hmm. an international sort of system or structure around it. But there's no, no reason why it can't be a learning opportunity for our students to next year create something that has a local uh, perspective, right? But they will have learned from something that already has the kind of training wheels on. So that they can learn about how an international organization runs something for an, uh, a global issue that then can become a local issue for us if we, right. if we wish that, right? I think it's important to be able to, to understand that there are international issues like hunger in Cameroon, but that's not that far removed from issues that are facing us here in Barcelona. Yeah. And that's that's a learning opportunity for our students as well. That's, that's what Martin can help us on, because he's often yeah. talking about soil quality just up the road and how soil erosion is, is making a difference to the type of food that can be grown and what's happening to our crops in the in Catalan, right? So we can make those links, but first of all, we have to understand both the global picture and then understand our slice and our role in the local picture. Um, so, so the next lecture that we're kind of going to commandeer this year, it happens every two years. I don't know how many of you actually know about the history of Orwell um, and the relationship of George Orwell with the school. Have you been told this in the, the walk around when you're in the first introduction? So the Orwell building over here was actually the san a sanatorium. It was used during the Spanish Civil War to house and rehabilitate patients who had been injured, one of whom was George Orwell, Eric Blair. So this is why every two years we have a lecture that's delivered by his son on campus. Um, and I, I gather from Charo the content is kind of similar each year. It's about Orwell's life. It's about his participation in, in, in fighting um, against the fascists on the, on the Spanish front. But also, we want to have this as an opportunity to talk about what do we mean by building a sustainable future when we think about other roles, so when we think about journalism, when we think about critical thinking, when we think about what is truth, when we think about how to be aware to what will make a sustainable future in terms of information sharing and in terms of being on the right side of history, right? And so those are the critical questions that we want to try and pose to our students and to our families to get us thinking about that is very much an event, Jennifer, that can only happen here. It's our event because it's our school and it's our history. And we need to start making those links for the students to be able to think about whatever the theme is, where do I sit? Where do I stand? What does the history of that building I walk in and out of every day mean to me? What is it important to know about being a member of a BFIS community that espouses values that have you know, an interesting part to play in both world history but also in local history? Um, and so we want to kind of make that part of the TAFI program and think about how we can weave in that storytelling around sustainability, but thinking about those other areas that don't scream sustainability. Having critical thinkers is part of having a sustainable future. So we need to be able to help them make those connections. It'd be great to have Serena weave that a bit more into the story details and additions. I it's changed, I know we talked about it at one point. Yeah. When I arrived, it was not really Well, this is going to be a public lecture that all of our parents will be invited to. No, so we, we will know. Really highlighting the, the, oh, yeah. the website, there is a tab that is about history. Is it's a, it's it's a, it's okay. Yeah, the relationship. Take it. 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 So that will be a cultural so, divide. Right. <laughs> Until so we explain the pep, pep rally is the right place to start. So yeah. the, the goal of a pep rally is just to show school spirit, to show school community, to build kind of excitement about a topic. So usually a pep rally would be like the football, the American football team. Like they have a game on Friday night. Let, let's like get everyone ready for this football game, American football game, something like that. So our goal here, and there was a pep rally last year, and as soon as I heard there's not pep rallies, 
and I heard there was a pep rally last year, the student, this 11th grade, now 11th grade student, I said, you, sir, are doing another pep rally, and we are going to make that happen straight away. So January 12th, I believe, is the first semester of pep rally. I'm like, we're doing a pep rally every semester. He's organizing it. That's his cast project for his 11th grade uh, project. And the goal for this uh, first pep rally is to support the programming that Bea is doing with after school sports, with everything like that. There's a basketball tournament being held at BFIS just next week. This next week, is it this week? This week here, Felix is on the team, the basketball team. Uh, so we're supporting and showing our, our sphere in relation to sports. That's the first semester. We've gotten a lot of requests in the parent rock group that that pep rally, I you know it hasn't been formal and now you're formalizing it would be brilliant, but if it could happen in the beginning of the semester of the year, like in the future, maybe in, in September, because it's like early on you need, to, before the sports team sign up happens, right. before, it would, yeah. be, it would be fantastic. Yeah. So I saw that on the house in September. Yeah, let's get it back on here. So then the second semester, yeah. The theme can be and should be and hopefully will be related to sustainability and talent. So this is a time for, and, and one of the things that the students talk about here is the fact that there's not a lot of times that the middle school, I mean, they're in the hallways all the time together, but not with a, with a guiding principle or a, an objective. So this is a time for second to high school, second to 12th grade. Um, coming together and actually being in the same space together at the same time and trying to build that kind of school spirit, community spirit. Um, so I think that those will be, those have an opportunity to be really successful and impactful for our students and building up that kind of organizational pride that we already have, uh, but we want to see uh, more from our students as well. So that is an opportunity for Taffy. That could be um, maybe not necessarily like a lecture but the idea is to be fun and light, and maybe it's a chance to highlight things that have already happened, projects that have already happened, that sort of thing, or recognize leaders, that sort of thing. Yeah. I already very briefly painted the picture of a symposium, so you kind of have an idea that it will be off campus. Um, we're in talks with, um, it's very likely that it will be held at the, the bookstore of one of our families, um, which is opening in the early part of next year. They have a large gallery space downstairs, it's in central Barcelona. Um, so it's a site that's connected to the community already that has, you know, an element of learning and of being, being intellectual about it. But it's also going to be a fun spot, space where we can have exhibition spaces up and we can have things up on the walls. Um, so the idea is that it will happen in the last week of school. We've got to pick which days. We want it to be able to be running for two, two days consecutively so that we have a chance for different age groups to filter through and different parents of different age groups to filter through and take a look. Um, and the idea is that the students will be there being able to speak about their exhibition pieces and kind of be curating the space. So those will be already chosen. We won't be able to pick everybody's work, so we will be highlighting the work of the students who we think really shines, and then their, their kind of sort of aspirational projects to show off to, to young people. Um, so you're very much invited to that symposium. That's the, that's the biggest part we want to let you know. And that hopefully your community uh, partners, projects, other, other colleagues, other friends, you'll bring them along and we'll, we'll be able to celebrate some of those projects that happen and you'll see what good looks like and our students will be able to see what good looks like so that that becomes part of our storytelling. Sorry, is that so it's the CAS project presentation? It's going to be CAS but also pre-CAS projects because in NYP they all need to do a personal project as well. Okay. So the goal is to work with Michelle. But it's all related to CAS even though we're calling it CAS based and important. Let's call it project based learning. Yeah, let's call, it, let's call it engagement projects because the students all have to complete the project in middle or in high. Um, obviously in high school in the IB, they have very, they have specific areas, right? But it's why The guy theme for the symposium is sustainability. Yeah. And so. we're not requiring students in 11th grade who are completing their CAS projects to complete a CAS project that is related to sustainability. However, we are encouraging it, and if there is that connection, then they will be demonstrated at the... Okay. So I understood that it was like the presentation of all the cast things, in the no. same way that IB Art, you know, each of the mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I thought yes. this was, oh, CAS is having a presentation of all the cast projects, but it's, it's no. not exactly... Yeah. Okay. But we would love to have Eventually, some of that art yeah. be displayed yeah. and demonstrated, or exhibited yeah. here as well. Yeah. yeah. So, I think we're basically near the end of what we wanted to show you. What we wanted to leave you with are some uh, of these slips so that you can have a think about what you might like to, to offer or to be able to do to get involved. And we also want to hear your ideas in groups. Um, so because we're small, we can talk to each other about kind of what's come up, questions, considerations. So 